Hello everyone, Russ Barkley here. Welcome uh, and a special welcome to my subscribers. So thank you all for subscribing to this channel. In this particular lecture, we're gonna talk about the diagnostic criteria that are currently used for diagnosing ADHD in children and adults. This is known as the DSM-5, which stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Uh, now, this revision of the DSM goes back to 2013. Uh, there have been a number of editions prior to that, uh, but this is the most recent one that lists the criteria the clinician should follow in making a diagnosis of ADHD. Now, keep in mind, diagnostic criteria aren't meant to be theories of disorders. Uh, they're not meant to convey a lot of conceptual or underlying uh, information about how the disorder comes to be, its etiologies, and so on. Uh, instead, it's a list of cognitive and behavioral symptoms, expressions of the disorder by which a clinician might suspect that the disorder is there. Uh, so it's meant to be a set of guidelines to clinicians for helping with diagnosis and especially differential diagnosis from other disorders. Now, the current version of the DSM, DSM-5, has a number of criteria that are used for the diagnosis. Among these, the first two are very important. There is a set of symptoms, nine in all, for describing the inattention that goes with ADHD, such things as uh, can't sustain attention, easily distracted, and so on. And then there is another list of nine hyperactive and impulsive symptoms. Uh, and of course, that includes six symptoms of hyperactivity, uh, as well as three additional symptoms that capture impulsivity. We're gonna talk about that list a little bit more because there are continuing to be some problems with that symptom list. Now, the DSM requires that there be at least six symptoms endorsed on either of those lists. So six inattention, six hyperactive impulsive, or 12 on both. And that would lead you to use the presentations that are listed in the DSM. More about that in just a moment. Now, each of the symptoms on these lists has the word often in front of it. And that's not just arbitrary. Research shows that that word often is not endorsed by the vast majority of the population, either with regard to kids or adults. So it has some statistical meaning. Only about two to upwards of 10% maximum of people endorse any symptom as occurring often or more frequently. So that gives the lie to critics who challenge the DSM criteria by saying, well, everybody has these symptoms some of the time. Well, yes, they do, but they don't have them often or most of the time. So right there, each symptom differentiates the individual from the rest of the general population. And if you have six of these symptoms that are occurring often or more, you're a very unusual individual. You're going to comprise about two to 4% of adults and about five to 8% of children. Now notice the DSM-5 says that we need six symptoms for diagnosing children and teens, but by adulthood, you only need five symptoms on each list, on either list, that is, to contribute toward this criteria of the diagnostic criteria. Now, the symptoms alone and that threshold alone are not sufficient to make a diagnosis. There are other things that have to be met. For instance, the symptoms have to be excessive for the individual's age and sex. Now, that means that you must be well beyond the occurrence that we see in other individuals. One way of assessing this, of course, is to use that number six as your symptom threshold. Another way that clinicians are encouraged to use this is to use rating scales of child or adult behavior that have these 18 symptoms on them and that we can use to compare the individual 
to others of the same age and sex in the general population. So there are norms on these rating scales that can give us some statistical guidance on just how deviant the individual is. The symptoms must have been there for at least six months or longer, and they must be occurring across several situations, not just in one specific place or time. So if a child just has difficulties getting ready for bed at night, that's not going to be adequate. We're talking about broad domains here of family functioning, home, community, uh, school, and peer groups, and so on. There must also be impairment in major life activities. You've heard me say this before, no impairment, no disorder. So impairment means ineffective functioning in major life activities to the extent that the environment is kicking back and there are negative or adverse outcomes occurring as a result of expressing these symptoms. Now the DSM says the symptoms have to develop by 12 years of age and that these must be corroborated by the reports of others, not just the self-reports of the child or the teen or the adult, but there must be other corroborative evidence through the reports of parents and teachers, for instance, when we're dealing with children and teens, or through the reports of others who know the adult well, such as a spouse, partner, close friend, sibling, and where those are not available, then corroboration through other sources of information, such as school documentation, such as report cards. And we want these symptoms to not be better explained by some other disorder. After all, inattention occurs in the vast majority of psychiatric disorders to varying degrees. Anxiety, depression, and so on all lead to episodes of inattentiveness. So inattention alone is not adequate to meet these criteria. We want to make sure that the individual has all of these criteria and sufficient symptoms for the diagnosis. Finally, the DSM says that there are three presentations, not types. There are no types of ADHD. There's just one ADHD. But at this particular point in time, in the clinic, which symptoms are more predominant? Is it mainly the inattentive? Is it mainly the hyperactive impulsive? Or is it both sets of symptoms? And that's where we get to the inattentive presentation hyperactive and combined type. But don't assume that there's something categorical or qualitatively different across these. I see this all the time in trade media articles on ADHD, that there are three types of ADHD. No, there are not. We got rid of those 10 years ago in favor of simply presentations. What do you look like today? Not what is it going to be like later? Because after all, people can go from the hyperactive type during the preschool years up to the combined type when they develop enough symptoms of inattention. And then by adulthood, when the hyperactivity is waning to a great extent, we can see them move into the inattentive presentation. So uh, the typing really doesn't matter here all that much. So let's take a look very quickly at what changed between the DSM-4 and DSM-5 just to update the criteria. Uh, first of all, the symptom list remains the same as it was back in the DSM-4 that prevailed before 2013. Still 18 symptoms, still phrased the same way. However, in DSM-5, there are some clarifications put in parentheses after many of the items to help the clinician with interpreting that symptom for teens or for adults. Because after all, the original DSM criteria, the original symptoms, that is, are phrased for children. Because as you know, back earlier in time, ADHD was primarily a childhood diagnosis. But now that we've extended it upward to adults, we need some kind of clarifications there. I'll have more to say about that in a moment as well. Also, as I've said, the symptom threshold for children and teens remains at six. But the new criteria, the DSM-5, reduces the number required for adults down to five. I'll have more to say about that in a minute, too. It also increased the age of onset from seven, 
up to age 12. That's a nice improvement. Not perfect, however. Again, more to say on that in just a moment. And again, I've said the DSM-5 requires corroboration of the self-reports of the individual. That wasn't required in the earlier DSMs, and it led to a number of problems in which the individual may or may not be very self-aware about their symptoms. As you know, ADHD reduces self-awareness to some extent, and therefore, at least for children and teens, we couldn't put a lot of stock into their self-reports. Hence now the requirement for corroboration. And then, as I've said, there are no more subtypes of ADHD. They were replaced with the term presentation. So those are kind of the major changes that occurred from the DSM-4 to DSM-5. Now, one other change that's noteworthy is that prior to the DSM-5, you could not diagnose autism spectrum with ADHD. They were considered exclusive disorders. That, of course, was a mistake. It was corrected in the DSM-5, and now you can give both diagnoses. So a very important change to the DSM-5 criteria. So here are some of the problems that the DSM-5 failed to address. Now, the committee for ADHD working on the DSM-5 criteria did try to make some of these changes. Not all of them, but some of them. But they were kind of shot down or refused as their recommendations moved up to higher level DSM-5 committees. So these problems continue to remain for DSM-5. Number one, the inattention list, I believe, really reflects executive functioning, as you know, and particularly working memory. So there's a broader cognitive impairment being represented here than just the term inattention can capture. Uh, and the DSM hasn't been able to clarify that for us. But Clinicians take heed. That symptom list really is a much broader list of executive functioning symptoms. Second, the symptoms of impulsiveness or poor inhibition are not well represented. There is only three symptoms, and they are primarily verbal in nature. But we know that the disinhibition cuts across all areas of behavioral expression. So it's not just verbal, it's motor, it's cognitive, it's motivational, uh, and it's behavioral. Uh, and so the individual uh, is not going to simply be limited to simply expressing verbal impulsiveness. And don't forget the emotional impulsivity that we see in this disorder. So those aspects of impulsiveness are not represented in the DSM. That's still a major problem. The ADHD committee did try to change that, did try to add in more symptoms of impulsivity, but their recommendations were turned down. So no new symptoms got in there. Uh, as I've just said, there are no symptoms representing the emotional self-regulation difficulties in ADHD, but we know that they are as central to ADHD as the other symptom dimensions are. And so that remains a problem for the DSM. That can be rectified, I think, by using rating scales of executive functioning in assessing patients, because those rating scales often include dimensions of inhibition that are broad spectrum and dimensions of emotion self-regulation. The symptoms in the DSM remain worded primarily for children. There was an effort to add those clarifications in parentheses as to how they might be applied to adults. The problem with that is that there was no empirical basis for these clarifications. They just made them up in the committee room on the fly. So they really haven't been tested as to whether they really are clarifications of those earlier symptoms or are they simply flat out new symptoms are they related to ADHD at all? Are they better accounted for by another disorder such as anxiety? We don't know. There simply was no research on those clarifications. Recently, Laura Naus and I have conducted a study in which we did look at whether those clarifications correlated with the original primary symptom. And we found that the correlations were modest at best uh, and that they shared perhaps maybe 25% or less of their variation, uh, which simply means that they act more like new symptoms than they do clarifications of symptoms. Excuse me if I 
PowerPoint is getting away from me here. So, uh, Now, another issue that was failed to be addressed in the DSM is the age of onset. Even though it was improved from age 7 to age 12, there shouldn't be an age of onset here because the recall of age of onset, either by the patient or by a family member, is very poor. And that's not just for ADHD, that's across all disorders. So not especially reliable or valid here, and I think it should be removed from the criteria, and I've been making that case since the late 1990s. Uh, after all, we know that at least a third of children don't meet these criteria, and upwards of perhaps a half or more of adults don't recall their disorder developing before the age of 12, much less the age of seven that was in the earlier criteria. So the age of onset remains problematic because you're imposing a criterion that is unreliable uh, and therefore doesn't make an awful lot of sense when it comes to making a diagnosis. Now, here is the age of onset. This is from a meta-analysis of the onset of major psychiatric disorders in the world. And what does it show for ADHD? Well, you can see here ADHD is number three in line, and it shows that the median age of onset is right around 12, meaning half of the individuals had their onset before 12 and half did not. Again, that illustrates the problem I just mentioned, that you, if you apply these or this criterion the way it's intended, you would miss half of the diagnoses that are legitimate for people who otherwise meet the criteria for ADHD. So that continues to be problematic as well. I encourage clinicians to ignore the age of onset because of its unreliability. If the individual meets all the other criteria for the disorder, they have the disorder, and it doesn't matter what the age was that it developed. Now also, as you know, as I said, the DSM-5 allowed us to lower the symptoms from six on either list down to five when diagnosing adults. But that's problematic because all of the research out there shows that the threshold should be four out of nine, not five. Uh, and the ADHD committee recommended that to the higher level committee, but higher level committees rejected such a drastic reduction in the number of symptoms for the disorder. But I tell clinicians that four symptoms is more than enough to make an adult quite statistically unusual, abnormal, if you will, relative to the population, and one doesn't need either five or six. So uh, that's another problem where the DSM uh, committees gave half measures to this recommendation that it be four symptoms, not five. Now, the thresholds are still based primarily on boys, although more and more girls were included in some of the field trials. Uh, principally, these criteria are more boys than girls by about three to one. So uh, because these are somewhat male-biased criteria, I encourage people to use rating scales of ADHD symptoms uh, that come with separate norms, not just for age, but also for sex. And then you can compare individuals to people of the same biological sex. Uh, so that's a very important criteria because girls can be impaired, symptomatic, and have full disorder, even if they don't necessarily have six symptoms on that symptom list. The rating scale would show you that that girl is unusual relative to the population in terms of the frequency and severity of her symptoms, even if she doesn't meet the symptom threshold of six on either symptom list. I think the duration's a little too short. Uh, the six-month duration is used across all of the mental disorders, uh, and in the case of ADHD, it probably should be at least a year or longer when we're dealing with preschool children, because many two- and three-year-olds have episodic symptoms of ADHD that go away within three to six months. But if an individual symptoms last at least a year or longer, that indicates uh, usually a enduring disorder that's going to be there 
by the time the individual gets into school. Uh, and then, as you know, the DSM requires that there be symptoms shown in several di different situations. Unfortunately, in the case of children and teens, clinicians have misinterpreted this to mean that there has to be parent and teacher agreement on the symptoms. No, there doesn't. That's not what the DSM means at all. There just has to be evidence that the symptoms are occurring in more than one situation, not agreement exactly on the number of symptoms between parents and teachers. So the way we use this is to blend the symptom count. If the parent gives you six and the teacher gives you four or five, but some of the items that the teacher endorses are different, it's the number of different items given by both individuals across settings that is used for the symptom count here in, in terms of meeting the symptom threshold of six on either list. So don't get into this madness of getting parent and teacher agreement. You won't get it. The correlation between what parents say and what teachers say about a child's behavior and psychopathology uh, correlates to about 0.25 to 0.3, meaning there's not an awful lot of agreement here between these individuals. Don't get caught up in the agreement problem. So, okay, so that's about it on the diagnostic criteria, what's good about them, what's not so good about them, how to make adjustments that you might in your clinical practice uh, in order to overcome many of these difficulties. And hopefully these will get corrected when DSM-6 comes out. I don't know when that's going to be. I haven't heard any information about any committees forming to create the next DSM. It's probably going to be a while. They usually put 10 or more years between these revisions. So, all right, everybody, thanks for joining me. Again, if you like the content here, please subscribe or recommend us to others. Uh, also, don't forget to have a look over at my website, russellbarkley.org. There's lots of free fact sheets over there under the fact sheets directory. Uh, and you can copy those out if you feel those would be helpful for you to use. Uh, and also there is a list of my various books, including my four most recent ones that you can have a look at over there as well. Thanks again, everybody, and be well.